Well, firstly, uh, it's Kevin Young giving the wake talk this year, not Peter Burgess. Uh, the organising committee thought they'd do something a little bit different and we'd uh, do a song and dance act together, but uh, I talked to Peter about this and, uh, and Peter was of the opinion that um, I should do it, uh, occupy the whole of the time. And, um, and while I was uh, spending a month crunching through all the NVT results, um, he would go to Bali, so thanks very much for that, Peter. The talk, uh, to, this is basically my uh, one night stand at, at the wheat, uh, looking at the wheat NVT results. Uh, Peter will be back next year, so um, this is, is my take on it. And uh, I think one of the, the main issues is. Uh, regarding mace. Now what we've seen is the rapid uptake of a of probably an exceptional variety in terms of adaptation to Western Australia. And I'm getting a lot of questions coming in to me. Are we taking too much of a risk by growing too much mace? Um, it looks like mace has already reached 40% and probably go over 50% within a very short time and who knows how high it's going to go. Um, so I've, I've looked at the NVT results. Basically in regard to mace, comparing varieties to mace, but I think it's important to put mace in context and my way of doing that is to to look at the, a bit of the history of uh, wheat, wheat varieties, the evolution of wheat varieties in Western Australia and what led up to the, the release of mace. So if we, I looked at the CBH uh, data that basically gave percent area uh, sown to different varieties. And, and when I first came here in the late 70s, Gamenia was actually the, uh, the highest yielding... Ooh, 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 wrong button. Um, Gamenia, a variety from New South Wales, was the highest... The, the, the variety of choice across Western Australia. You see after that, um, in the early days, there was a South Australian line, Hellbird. Um, the, the early stages of uh, wheat... Uh, varieties from the West Australian program uh, in Gutha. You've got to remember the history of wheat breeding in Western Australia is really quite short. In the eastern states, the breeding programs at Horsham, at Roseworthy and at Narrabri that have been going for over 100 years. The big investment in wheat breeding in Western Australia didn't really start until the, the 1970s. And so what we saw was the early varieties coming out like Gutha, Coolin, Cadu, uh, Amory, which were the, really the first round of varieties coming from that breeding program. And those involved in breeding know that it's not the first round varieties that make the big impact. It's the when you get into the second and third round. And in those days, the first round varieties were competing with South Australian lines like Spear and Aruna and Hellbird. And at one stage, over 50% of the crop in Western Australia was sown to South Australian varieties. But then you'll see the success of the Ag Department breeders and the, they, where they really hit the mark with their second and third round breeding with Carnamark and, and Westonia in particular and Kalingri. Then came the, the piece de resistance, I suppose, Wildcatch, and where you combine that high level of adaptation to Western Australia with a a very short variety, high harvest index and a very stable high yield. Now remember that some of the early successes, Spear in particular, was a, a dominant variety. While Catchem, the new benchmark for yield. And so if you keep that in mind and then look at mace, the rapid take-up of mace that's happened since its release in 2009, and then consider that mace is built on wild catchem, and it combines the best traits of wild catchem with the best traits from the spear family, it's not really that surprising that a variety like mace has really become the stable variety in Western Australia. There are other later maturing lines that are hanging in there. Yitpi, which is a spear type wheat, is hanging in down in the, the Lakes District. I'll talk about that and I'll also talk about magenta. Now what I'm going to do is look at the 
the NVT database, probably if you've just sat through Alison uh, Kelly's talk, she's talking about various environmental groups. What I'm going to be doing is defining what some of those environmental groups might be, where varieties other than mace fit. So if we think about the basics for starters, and this is how I've approached my analysis of the data, is that choice of a wheat variety, yield stability to me is king. Farmers don't want varieties that are going to be fantastic yield one year and then lose the money the next. Quality stability is also incre incredibly important. They don't want a high yielding variety that's going to go through the roof for screenings. They want to make as much money as they can, obviously. AH varieties are preferred. Yellow leaf spot resistance preferred. And then we have to consider areas of specific adaptation. Like they might not want necessarily the highest yielding wheat, but the safest one from an early May sowing. Perhaps uh, a, ver a variety that they know that can handle very low pH soils or one that has re reduced frost risk. So the process I went through, I didn't have any special access to the MVT data. I went to the MVT in online site and I downloaded, just as any, any one of you could, all of the yield data from uh, 2008 to 2012 which is the years in which MACE was in the database. I downloaded ag zones, sowing dates, soil pHs, all of this data is available to you, and previous crop. I compared all of the new releases to the variety MACE and this culminated while Burjo was sitting in my beach in Bali. I ended up with hundreds of graphs and tables and enormous database to go through to try and find where each of the newer varieties, I concentrated on the newer varieties like Cobra, Emu, Rock, Korak, where, they, where their fit might be. To make it a little bit more feasible, I noticed that the trends showed up best if I restricted to ag zones two and four, which represent the majority of the West Australian crop anyway. Now, when I was at a... Uh, wheat physiology workshop in, at Simmet years ago, I, one of the presenters pre presented the data of a new wheat variety in relation to an old one in relation in, in this manner. And if you bear with me, oh, it's going to be quite a few graphs go up like this. This is basically head-to-head -head yield of mace compared to wild catchum and the dark, dark, the black, thick black line, sorry, is the one-to-one -one line. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about the one-to-one -one line. Obviously, where mace is above the one-to-one -one line, its yield is higher than, than wild catchum. Where it's below the one-to-one -one line, its yield is, is, is less than wild catchum. Sorry, above, it's higher than wild catchum. Below, it's less than wild catchum. Now, the data that was shown in Simmet, there was a variety that had a lot of points down here crossed over and a lot of points up here. And so there was a, like uh, some of the, the environments Alison was talking about, uh, and a good example was Cobra that she, and I'll be talking about that later, um, basically showed that well, there were environments that the new variety was weak in and other environments that they were strong in. If you look at the individual years, I've plotted a, a linear regression through the individual years, you'll see the slope on that line for 2008 is about 1.7% in the favour of, of mace. Every single year, mace is higher yielding, the slope is higher than wild catchum, which tells you that mace is very stable across years, huge amount of variation between those years, there are very few points below the one-to-one -one line. If you look at magenta, there is an enormous scatter. And if you look at the dark in relation to wild catchum, there's a lot of points below the one to one line. There's a scatter above that are all in 2008. And what was it about 2008? 2008 was a really bad frost year. So it's quite possible that there were NVT sites with the later maturing magenta being favoured in that, that frost year. 
If you look at magenta versus mace, you see a pretty sorry story. The vast majority of points at a range of yields are below the one-to-one -one line. There are isolated situations in which magenta has a yield advantage. And the trick is, for the cluster analysis that Alison is doing and for agronomists to find out where, what those situations are in which magenta does have its advantage. So one of the big questions we're asked is what's the influence of previous crop? Can NVT give us uh, any clues as to say what is the best wheat in a wheat on wheat rotation? Especially, that's the, the big question we get asked because that is probably one of the the feedback we're getting is that mace is a bit weak, wheat on wheat. Its yellow leaf spot resistance is not as good as the likes of magenta and, and wild catchem. Unfortunately, when I looked at the NVT database, the answer was no. Very few of the, of the sites were sown wheat on wheat. The vast majority were wheat after canola. Basically, all it told me was that mace was the same wheat on wheat as it was on the other, uh, other rotations. The grower observations are, are quite different, and the big driver of that is yellow leaf spot. So I thought, well, I looked at the sites that were wheat on wheat, and they're in quite dry areas that didn't get yellow leaf spot. So I then thought, well, OK, I'll go to spe some specific sites. And I remembered that I saw these sites in 2011. Buntine and Minginu were hammered by yellow leaf spot. Significantly, oop, wrong button again. Significantly, if you look at the yields of mace, and I've put their, uh, their data up as a percentage of mace, the lines with the highest level of yellow leaf spot really came through. It was a pretty high yielding year that year, but magenta out yielding mace at Minginu, magenta out yielding mace at Buntine under that huge yellow leaf spot load. Cobra likewise, and the, and the the data for yellow leaf spot resistance that's coming out of the disease nursery and what we're seeing in the field for cobra is, is they're in conflict. Korak, again, improved yellow leaf spot resistance over mace and out yielding it. Scout, an absolute shocker for yellow leaf spot and the yield's terrible. Well, catch them a bit terrible. So I think, to be fair on the NVT database, it can't be all things um, in terms of defining all of the, the niches that a, 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 a new wheat variety may be adapted to and extra measurements from the NVT could help to highlight what are the, uh, what are the, the lines that are best in a yellow leaf spot situation. The other big uh, issue in Western Australia is subsoil acidity. Now we know from past studies that Westonia, of the older group of varieties, Westonia has the best aluminium tolerance. And Westonia has been a good performer on the acid subs, on the soil types with acid, acid subsoils and aluminium, high aluminium lifts. Now when I looked at, from the, at the database, the relationship between new varieties and mace, it was just a dog's breast breakfast, the, the data was all over the place. But I thought, well, logically, aluminium tolerance, since aluminium is in the subsoil, is really only going to be expressed if the roots are actually going down and extracting moisture from depth. So I thought, well, 2011 was a wet year. The roots are most definitely going to be down in the aluminium layer. So what is, the, can I identify a relationship in 2011? And this is the yield of Westonia relative to mace plotted against subsoil pH. So you've got obviously your most acidic subsoils over here. And the R squared is quite weak, but I think it demonstrates that there is a, um, is a relationship between Westonia's aluminium tolerance and its yield compared to mace. Now there's the new variety released Cobra is derived from Westonia and is reputed to have good acid soil tolerance and if you keep your eye on that graph I'll switch to Cobra and you can see in Cobra in the 2011 data 
the same sort of trend coming up. Now Alice and Kelly showed in some instances Cobra much higher yielding and much lower yielding in other instances coming through from the cluster analysis and it's measurements like this in the MVT database that are hopefully going to define what those clusters are and enable agronomists to use the information from those clusters more usefully. So this, if we just uh, stick with COBRA and look at my one-to-one -one relationship in the yield of COBRA, the head-to-head, -head, sorry, relationship of yield of COBRA to MACE. And here's our one-to-one -one line. And this is the sort of thing that I saw in that CIMIT conference that I was talking about where you get a classic crossover Above two and a half tonne per hectare are the sites that Cobra is showing a yield advantage over maize. Some of those could also be sites that have low, low subsoil pH and a high level of yellow leaf spot. Down here, below two and a half tonne per hectare, Cobra is struggling. And again, I refer back to Alison's talk. She said, look, there's two environmental groups here. Cobras perform poorly in this environmental group and really well in this one. Well, the one it produced poorly, and I noticed the yield of that one was around about one and a half ton per hectare. And the one in which Cobra performed very well, the yield was up around three and a half ton per hectare. So there's various ways you can look at the MVT data. This is one way. There's no, I think, right way. It's a matter of combining all of the information. But this gives us a pretty good clue by looking at it in this way how we view a new variety like Cobra. In that, of the early maturing lines, Cobra clearly, from what I've seen, is best at the low soil pHs. It's best at yields above two and a half tonne per hectare, and it's going to be best if you've got a high likelihood of a yellow leaf spot infection. So when you're looking for varieties that will complement mace, if you don't want to grow wall-to-wall -wall mace, they're the sorts of things to, to, to be looking at. Of the other new early maturing varieties, varieties, I got pretty excited about Corac, seeing its yield data from 2010 and 2011, two very contrasting years. It was out yielding mace uh, quite consistently. Uh, even though it's only APW, it does, as I said, have very good yellow leaf spot resistance. And so the 2012 results were a bit of a surprise, and I'm going to move on to them next. Uh, and the other variety, the other early maturing variety, Emu Rock, what, where do they fit? So Corac, when you looked at the 2010 data, it was positive uh, well and truly above MACE. 2011, that was a dry year. 2011, the wet year, again, it's out yielded MACE. All of a sudden, in 2012, it's crashed. It's potentially a very high yielding variety, but what went wrong last year? I mean, we've got some sites here last year where it's the, the triangles where it's well below the, the mace line. In previous years, that hadn't happened. So what does that tell you? Last year was a frost year. Perhaps Corac being earlier maturing um, was a bit more prone to frost damage at those sites. And I looked at the yields at some of these sites, at the, sorry, the, the temperature data at some of these sites where Cobra had, real, uh, Corac, sorry, had really crashed and there were um, a lot of uh, days around flowering where it was below zero. I suppose we don't know for sure whether, uh, if that's the reason for Corac's instability, but what we know is that unfortunately in this environment, it's very, very high yielding, but there are going to be occasions where it will let you down. Emu Rock, if you just look at Emu Rock uh, on, on the surface, all of the data is below the one-to-one -one line compared to MACE. So at first glance, you look at the slope of that line, you say, OK, it's 5% lower yielding than MACE, why bother? But if you look more closely and keep in mind that Emu Rock is a very early maturing line, you look at the yields two tonne and below, Emu Rock is very competitive with mace and, in, and on occasions out yielding mace. And you can learn from individual sites. And I learned from 
the salmon gum site last year, for instance, that went just over a tonne per hectare, um, I was there at the field day, I was blowing a scream in northerly of 32 degrees on a early September and we got no spring rain after that. Now Emu Rock topped that trial in conjunction with Corac. They were both significantly better than Mace and I think if there's a fit for Emu Rock that's where it is. Clearly being so early maturing at the very high yielding sites it's not competitive with Mace but two tonne, and, two tonne per hectare and below and a fair bit of the West Australian crop is two tonne per hectare and below. Emu Rock is worth considering. If we move away from the egg zones two and four and go to five, six, where uh, the late, there is a definite role for the late maturing lines like Yitpi, um, well, the late maturing lines uh, basically for, for the northern areas I've mentioned, magenta, um, probably best suited in the northern areas to early May sowing, especially if you've got you know, a leaf spot around. It can express its yield potential and in the south, Yitpi, which is a spear type wheat, is hanging in there. It's still very popular, it's still a significant amount of the West Australian crop, in spite of the fact that it's inherently lower yielding in mace. It's very susceptible to yellow leaf spot and stem rust. It's still hanging in there, and it's hanging in there for the reason that it is late maturing, it's adapted well to early sowing, and there's studies that, uh, that have been done on, on frost susceptibility and Ben Bidoff's in the audience and I urge you to go along to his talk if frost is an important issue in your area. But they are picking up subtle differences between varieties and the Yitpi types are showing up as having less frost susceptibility. I've been very careful, Ben, not to mention the word tolerance. They have less susceptibility to the very susceptible types, which include the wild catchum types. So one of the risks of being wall-to-wall -wall mace is your wall-to-wall -wall wild catchum type and have the potential of really setting yourself up for the maximum frost damage. So the role of the YPI types is for early sowing and marginally better um, head structure to resist frost. Um, of the new spear type wheats, Scout and Envoy are not late maturing like Yippie. They are earlier maturing, they're much probably closer, a little bit later than Mace, so they don't fit the, the bill for that Yippie type frost avoider. There is, their yields up north are not that good, down south um, they are competitive, slightly, with Mace but one of their major attributes is they are pretty good for falling number if harvest rain, maintaining falling number if harvest rain goes through. The only one that's really out there as a, as a, a true Yitpi maturity spear type is SDOC. And this really demonstrates, I suppose, that it's, it's a, we're in a in pretty poor state with the lines that are coming through from the breeding companies, the later maturing lines are just not coming through. There's this huge flood of these early maturing lines and the emphasis is, is in that area. And we're lacking a late, later maturing type. S-Stock, like Yitpi, is a bit later maturing. It does have stem rust resistance. It is pretty reasonable for falling number and maintaining its falling number, but it is very susceptible to yellow leaf spot. The promising thing with SDOC is when you look at it head to head with YITPI, in egg zones 5 and 6 it looks like it could give you about a 5% yield increase, something in that order. So in summary, it's a very condensed version of an a, a enormous number of graphs and tables but the key messages, my three key messages, stretch to nine actually. If you're thinking about mace and, and, and uh, how suitable it is as a mainstay variety, um, my message I suppose it is, it is that it's highly suitable. Um, over the five years it's shown very high level of, of stability. Um, it has, it's just basically a good all-rounder. Um, it does has its limitations. It, it has the TSN1 gene, so it has a major gene for yellow leaf spot resistance, but it's oh, 
uh, the yellow leaf spot is not anywhere near as high as um, other varieties. And um, I'm glad that's being taped. You can cut that bit out. Uh, it is early maturing, so if you're in a, a frost-prone uh, area, be conscious of the fact that you, you, know, you, you don't want wall-to-wall -wall one maturity. Um, there may be better varieties on very low subsoil pH. It's not a complete dog on so low subsoil pH, but there may be variety, better varieties come through. So the selection of varieties to complement mace should be based on its limitations. Magenta, best suited to early May, where there's high probability of yellow leaf spot. Emu rock, for the shorter growing season areas, uh, two tonne or less is where you're going to get your best results from emu rock. Korak, Keep in mind that it's only APW. There's not that much of the, uh, the West Australian crop that's high protein. But there's plenty of situations where a really high yielding APW wheat uh, is uh, something that is desirable. Um, but there's this little question mark, I think, over, over frost. Cobra, I've been through its adaptation. Basically the low pH, high yield, make use of its yellow leaf spot resistance. Estoc for early sowing, Scout and Envoy, perhaps down the south coast as uh, if you don't want to be wall-to-wall -wall mason, you want something that's reasonable for falling number. So that's my take on 2012 MVT in conjunction with the previous four years. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Uh, we've got time for a question. Uh, this gentleman here. Yeah, I just want to commend you on your use of aggression and very elegantly showing us how those differences in the varieties really came out. Now, you had a choice. You could have gone with these environmental clusters of sites which differ every year, as we saw in the previous presentation, but you showed in yours uh, that if you added to it a high B value showing responsiveness and uh, deviations from regression, you've got a pretty good measure and, and, and we could see it graphically by what you did. Did you choose to go the regression approach rather than looking at these environmental clusters? Because certainly to me sitting here it was far more interpretable your method. And everyone's got their favourite method and I'm just someone who likes to look at the whole of the data. And I think if you look at the whole of the data, in, in, uh, in you can tell a story. And, you, and uh, it's just my, my personal preference. It's my way of teasing out the niches, if you like. Any further questions? Uh, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, talk and summary. It's uh, good to see. There's one little hole that I'm having trouble with, and I don't think you've covered it here, and that is basically from you've got for early sowing, and with the rainfall we've had this year, the probabilities of early sowing are quite high with subsoil moistures around the place. You've got Yippee south of Great Eastern Highway. Mm. You've got magenta maybe in the north a little, but more in the north. How do you see with uh, Kalingri versus magenta north of Great Eastern Highway? Where would you put things? Did you see anything in your analysis? Not especially between Kalingri and Magenta. When I looked at Kalingri, it was hard to follow um, where, that, where the niche actually was. I mean, so no, no, I, I didn't really identify that. And I think, you know, again, it highlights this lack of late maturing lines that we've got and, the, and too much emphasis on the early. I suppose the early maturing one's where the money is, so it's obvious. <laughs> If you want to survive in wheat breeding, you go where the money is. But um, it, it would be nice to see some more later maturing op um, alternatives coming through. All right, um, we might wind it up there. I'd just like you to thank Kevin for his presentation this morning. Oh, I forgot the last slide, which was the acknowledgement.